great. Okay, so um, hello everyone. Thank you so much for joining another NOVEC talk. My name is Paulius. I am the managing director of the Center for Social Norms and Behavioral Dynamics at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, and welcome to another talk. Today, we are going to have a very similar agenda to previous occasions. Um, there will be a very short welcome message from me. Uh, then we're going to see the pre-recorded video from one of our early career researchers. Um, then we will have the main talk by Professor Sadi Lalu. Um, I will present him in a moment. And then we will have 15 minutes for questions. Um, as always, yeah, you can ask questions on the, on the chat. Um, yeah, so a reminder, as always, that this um, speaker series is organized by our Center for Social Norms and Behavioral Dynamics at the University of Pennsylvania. We are a research center that does consulting, research, and training to enable organizations to sustainably enact positive behavioral change um, around the world. You have our web page here with all our information. Um, and also another reminder that I also shared in um, the email today is that we're looking for a new director of our Master of Behavioral and Decision Sciences. Uh, you can find the information in um, our web page and, and you can scan the QR code here to have more information. Um, Today, I am not going to share, as I always do, um, information about one of our projects because I want to show you the full um, list of speakers that we have. So um, first, the summer one in which we, we are now. Uh, so today we have Professor Sadi Lalu. Um, in three weeks, we will have um, Ben Sislagi from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine together with Gary Darmstadt from Stanford University, speaking um, about joint research on gender equality, norms, and health. Um, it will be a double speaker talk. Um, and then on September 9th, we will have Professor Marie-Claire Villeval um, speaking um, as well. After that, we will take a short break of around a month and then um, I'm very happy to announce our full um, list of speaker for, uh, speakers for this year. Uh, we will start on October 7th with um, the CEO of the Behavioral Insights team in the US, Michael Holsworth. Um, then the week after that, we will have a special event with Christina Vicari and a few of our center members um, to present our new working paper series. And then we will have um, several speakers um, roughly two weeks um, away. Uh, we will soon upload all these details into our website so you can check um, there. And we will use the same link and same Zoom information. We will just add the new dates into Zoom. In terms of uh, ground rules, if this is the first time that you are joining us, uh, please remember to stay muted. Um, if you can, please keep your camera on so that we have a more interactive experience. Um, if you can, please include your affiliation next to your name, your username, so that we know where you're joining from. Um, for questions, as before, um, we will have um, a co-author in the audience, um, which in this case um, will be me. Um, so you can ask questions during the talk um, in the chat and then with the raise hand function at the end. We are, as always, uh, transmitting live on Facebook and the recording will be available next week on our website as well. Um, having said this, um, I'm going to play in a moment our early career researcher presentation video uh, for this week. Uh, Dr. Abdelaziz al Sharawi is a PhD graduate from Virginia Tech University here in the US, and his presentation is called Fear of COVID-19 Changes Economic Preferences, Evidence from a Repeated Cross-Sectional MTurk Survey. Um, as always, you have his uh, professional 
website um, there and you can scan the QR code to um, get more information as well. So let me share the... Media. Hello, my name is Abdelaziz Al Sharawi, and I'm a PhD candidate at Virginia Tech's Economics Department. In this study, we investigate how the experience of intense emotion, particularly fear during the early stages of the COVID 19 the pandemic influences economic preferences. A classical notion in economic modeling is that economic preferences are stable. There is a wave of recent studies, however, that contradict this notion. For example, willingness to take risks was influenced by exposure to financial crises, natural disasters, or violent attacks. This was also the case for social preferences such as reciprocity or contributing to the public good. We aim to understand how exposure to the COVID-19 crisis influences economic preferences particularly during the early weeks of the pandemic. In this repeated cross-sectional study, we administered an online survey using Amazon Mechanical Turk for a sample of around 1,500 people residing in the United States. We collected a third of our data every two weeks, starting on April 2nd. There were approximately 200,000 confirmed COVID-19 cases by our first wave that tripled two weeks later before hitting a million by our third wave. For the number of deaths, it was a little under 3,900 in our initial wave and about 26,000 two weeks later before surpassing 50,000 by our third wave. We aim at identifying how self-reports of fear of the COVID-19 pandemic influence economic preferences using survey questions that were experimentally validated. We thus measure this aversion, time preference, altruism, and reciprocity. Here is our empirical model. In the upcoming slides, I will report the coefficients of self-reported fear, this beta, and local death rate, this gamma, on the measured economic preferences. Note, however, that we included state and survey time fixed effect, along with a series of individual level controls. Now let's look at some results. What I present here are the estimates for beta and gamma of the regression that measure how fear of the COVID-19 and local death rate influence our economic preferences. Again, while controlling for individual characteristics and state and time fixed effects. For willingness to take risks, we find that fear is negatively and significantly associated with risk tolerance. This association, however, was becoming weaker over time. We also find that local death rate during wave one is associated with lower risk tolerance. Again, this effect was fading over subsequent waves and actually absent in the pooled sample. For our measure of patients, we find that fear of the pandemic promoted impatience. On the other hand, we also find evidence that higher local death rate increased patients in our pool sample. In our working paper, we discuss an instrumental variable approach that tests the robustness of these results. And it gives support for the credibility of our estimates for um, uh, uh, risk taking and patients. Next, we turn to social preferences. When we look at altruism or willingness to get to good causes, we find that fearful individuals reported higher tendency for altruism during our third wave and in the pooled sample. Also, higher local death rate had a similar effect in our pooled sample. When we turn to negative reciprocity or willingness to take revenge, we find that fear of the pandemic is negatively and strongly associated with negative reciprocity. Again, the effect was fading across time. Note, however, that in our first wave, we find instead that higher local death rate increased willingness to take events. We also explored the drivers of fear. Even though local death rate was significantly and positively associated with fear, levels of reported fear had declined over time. Also, individuals who expected health hardships for themselves or their families due to COVID-19 were reporting higher fear levels. Expectations of financial hardship had a weaker association with fear levels, however. Importantly, we also find that trust measures are strong mediators of fear. Trust in people and government ameliorates fear, while trust in the media increases it, potentially due to stronger media-driven awareness of the pandemic. Additionally, stronger beliefs that people are engaging in social distancing were associated with lower fear levels. Note that political orientation was not a significant predictor for fear when we control for our trust measures here. 
suggesting that it's trust in people and institutions rather than political attitude per se that mitigates fear of the pandemic. To summarize, we find a negative and significant relationship between respondents' willingness to take risks or to delay rewards and their self-reported fear of the pandemic. Also, we find that trust in people and institutions was significantly associated with reduced fear. Policies that promote trust may generate positive economic spillovers by reducing fear during crises and encouraging investment. I'd like to thank you for your attention. Please reach out to me if you have any questions. And here is a link to our working paper. Hello. Great. Um, thank you so much to Abdelaziz. Um, I see that he's here in the audience today. So if you have any questions, any comments, you would like to discuss anything, um, please feel free to, to write in the chat. Um, yeah, and thank you so much for, for sending your video. Um, great, so uh, before starting with our main talk, just one more reminder that um, in three weeks, we will have our next talk by Dr. Ben Sislagi and Professor Gary Darmstadt about gender equality norms and health. Um, also on a Thursday, same time and same Zoom link. So I hope you will join us for that. Um, great, and with that, I'm going to present our speaker for today. So let me just uh, stop the share. Uh, so, Professor Sadi Lalou is the director of the Paris Institute for Advanced Study. He is the chair of social psychology at the Department of Psychological and Behavioral Science um, of the London School of Economics. And he is um, a new member of the advisory board of our uh, center as well. Um, he is a social psychologist with uh, more than 25 years of experience of management in industry, research, and government. He has directed five research units, including the Department of Consumer Science at Credoc, the Research Group on Sociology of Organizations at Electricité de France, uh, the Laboratory of Design for Cognition at EDF R&D, and the Department of Social Psychology at LSE, which is today the Department of Psychological and Behavioral Science. Um, currently, of course, the Paris Institute for Advanced Study. Uh, he has more than 100 scientific publications and he has pioneered the use of text mining in social psychology for the analysis of social representations and developed the subjective evidence-based ethnography method, among other things. Um, and he was the director of the doctoral program of, of social psychology at LSE for six years and a member of the steering committee of the Commissariat General du, du Plan, which is the French Prime Minister's forecast and planning unit. Um, so thank you so much, Sadi, for joining us. Um, and yeah, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much, Paulius, uh, for this introduction. Thank you very much to the center for inviting me for this NOVA talk. I'm extremely happy to be with you today. I'm going to try to share my slides. Um, and, uh, okay, uh, wait a minute, oops. Can you see that properly? Yes. Excellent, so I'll go on. So today I'm going to talk to you about um, layers of the regulation of behavior in large state societies and how they can be leveraged for behavioral change. Um, and so here's my outline. I'll first give you a little bit of background on methods on how uh, I came to what I'm going to present to you today. I'm going to describe you um, installation theory, which is the framework that, that I'm using uh, and how it can be applied for, for interventions. And so, first of all, where does this come from? Um, years ago, I was working at EDF R&D and we were studying uh, uh, how uh, the workforce that works in offices, cognitive workers, uh, would be impacted by the digital revolution and how we could help them. And it was very difficult to understand why people act. And we had to 
design a, a new technique to understand what's behind behaviors that are not so obvious. I'll give you a quick extract from a 1998 film which describes how we started developing, how I started developing that, that technique. As an outside observer, you can wonder why the subject stops typing and dials a number on her phone. But when you see inside her visual field from the perspective provided by the subcam, you see that she has slightly turned her head to the left while drinking her coffee. Hence a post-it note with a telephone number and a name comes into the center of her visual field and catches her attention. So our whole problem was to understand why people act, right? What, what are the, the, the reasons for behavior? And uh, in continuing and developing new uh, environments for cognitive workers, I, I set up this very large uh, living lab, uh, which worked for 10 years. There was a whole building instrumented with dozens of cameras working 24 seven and many volunteers uh, experimenting the new digital techniques in what uh, was an office of the future. I mean, by 2002 or three, we had the equivalent of what is Google Works by now, lots of video conferencing and all that stuff. And so we've been doing a lot of uh, interventions and experiments to see how we could modify behavior of people to make them more adapted to a different kind of work. And from um, all this kind of research, we, we came to develop new techniques for analysis of behavior. And the one I'm, I'm using mostly now is called CB, Subjective Evidence-Based Ethnography. And it collects two data streams. The first data stream is uh, using a very small video camera that, that, that people work, uh, wear on their glasses here to get a first person perspective uh, uh, recording and sound also in stereo of what people are doing really from the perspective of their vision. And then we show these tapes uh, to the participants and they comment uh, to us uh, their action. And what is absolutely remarkable with that technique, and we can come back to that uh, in Q&A later if you want, is the amazing capacity of, of participants to remember with extreme precision what happened at the time of action. For example, here you see, uh, this is an anesthetist commenting uh, something that happened uh, the day before. And you can see that she is able to remember uh, what was the saturation of oxygen or, or, or the blood uh, uh, you know, pulse of, of somebody that she, she was uh, uh, working on at that moment. And the fact that um, memory is, is something that is connected with movement and, and with the context, when you put back people in the same situation, they remember very accurately what, what happened under mental state. So we have, in a way, a capacity of having a good introspection, which, is, which was the graal of psychology for decades, and now technology enables us to have this. And based on all this, what we noticed, because we were looking for the determinants of action, is by reconstructing with the participants why they acted uh, at, uh, at every moment of, of, their, of their activity. Um, in many, many situations, and we applied uh, CB in, in situations like shopping, uh, professional training, uh, police patrolling, nuclear plant pilots, uh, and, and dozens, uh, dozens literally of, of other uh, situations, professional or, or family or social. Um, it's, it's quite clear that the determinants of, of behavior are of three different types. You have first uh, the material context, the affordances, that it was what people can do. Then you have the embodied competences of the, of the subject, what they can understand, what they can do, their knowledge, their representations, and what is socially desired and acceptable by others. I mean, that's the social regulation and behavior. Uh, if you want to understand behavior, you need these three different layers, right? So that was what came out of, of all these, these studies. And it may sound pretty obvious, but then once you've got this, how do you actually analyze and redesign uh, behavior? And that's, 
That's what installation theory uh, is about. So if, if as I just said, uh, behavior in society is, is channeled by three types of determinants, affordances, the material context, embodied competence, and social regulation, it turns out that these components are not accidental nor independent. Uh, they actually operate as a constructed bundle that channels smooth, predictable, and efficient performance. And I call these bundles installations, right? So today I'm just going to describe these installations and quickly uh, uh, sort of uh, um, describe a little bit of the installation theory, which says that you know, there is redundancy in these components and that is what provides resilience in, in channeling of behavior. But also installations are actually the place uh, where practice uh, reproduces structure and where people learn behavior in doing, right? So uh, societal reproduction and evolution uses installations, but I will not have much time to go over this. I'll just uh, insist on the fact on how installations can be used to change behavior. So here's a definition of installations specific local societal settings where humans are expected to behave in a predictable way. They consist of a set of components that simultaneously support and control individual behavior. And these components are distributed over three different types of layers. The material of environment, that's affordances, the subject embodied competences and the social space, that's social regulation. These components assemble at the time and place the activity is performed. This, this seems simple, but that is absolutely not trivial and think a moment about this. An installation is a compound of components of very different epistemic nature. It is distributed in the physical environment, in people and in the social space. So it's a very strange combination but actually, even though the elements belong to different layers, different epistemic categories, they are part of the same single bundle that is designed, co-designed to channel a specific performance or uh, oh, um, activity. Let me give you an example. When you take the plane from the moment you come at the airport to, to, uh, <clears throat> uh, to register, to, to, to check in, and the moment after the flight where you collect your luggage on the other side, you practically take no decision yourself. You are channeled all along. Maybe you have to, the choice of what drink you take in the plane, or do you go to the duty-free shop or not, but everything else is completely planned and predictable, but still you don't feel constrained, right? That is because there is an installation of airlines for flight, right? And this installation includes components that are physical, like the seats in the plane, or our regulations, like what you have to do in terms of passport uh, uh, presentation, or now currently the COVID regulation, and also the know-how of the passengers and what they know how they know how to walk, they know how to put their luggage in the trolley, and they know how to find their seat with the number on, on, on their um, on their ticket. Right, but what is absolutely strange here is that um, all the passengers in the plane behave the same, which means that these installations supersede all the classic explaining variables, whatever their age, gender, nationality, religion, even the reasons for which they're traveling. These people all comply and behave in a very predictable way. And that is because they are channeled all along in a tunnel of behavior by these installations. And these installations are precisely designed for this. Okay, right. And when you think of it, most of your life in social settings takes place in installations where in that specific uh, you know, moment and place, your behavior is predictable. A lecture, a shower, dental practice, a flea market, an election tribunal, name any social occasion. Most of your life happens in such places where you are channeled to behave as predicted. That doesn't mean that your behavior must you know, uh, be exactly uh, predicted, but roughly it is predicted. You know, this is a lecture. 
I am behaving as the speaker and you're behaving as the listeners, um, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, this doesn't go into great detail that this installation doesn't exactly predict what I'm going to say, but still it predicts I'm going to speak only 45 minutes and I'm going to show PowerPoint that is compatible with the system, et cetera, et cetera. And I behave and I comply. And most public places, most public space, most activity in public space takes place in installations. So roughly, you could even say that from cradle to grave, uh, we live most of our lives in installations. Okay. Right. So we have uh, three levels of determination of behavior, and I'm, I am now going to, to describe these more uh, in detail one after the other. But uh, you should note that these layers are, in a way, they are somehow redundant, and we'll, we'll come back to this. The overlay, you know, what you can do here in the material affordances, what you know how to do in your embodied competencies and what you're supposed or expected to do in the social, they, they are, you know, uh, they have an intersection. And the center of that intersection is what creates uh, this behavioral tunnel. So affordances, that's a term forged by uh, uh, James Gibson, the psychologist, and says affordances are what things enable you to do and call you to do in a way. Um, they do not cause behavior, but they constrain or control it. Gibson's theory is that we perceive the environment as possible things to do, right? For example, you get in a bus, you don't see a seat, a seat you see a sitting affordance, a possibility to sit, right? And there are experiments that show that we do naturally perceive the environment as with what we actually can do. So you, when you look at the staircase, depending on how big, your, um, how long your legs are, for example, you will see the stairs as climbable or not climbable. You have integrated, uh, you know, by experience, uh, what you can do with your body. And when you see the possibility of, of, of action, that's how you perceive the environment, affordances. Okay, now the second layer uh, are the representations and all the other embodied skills that you carry around with you that you have incorporated, that you have embodied, right? And these enable you to interpret the objects and situations. This could be innate, like your capacity to digest some types of food, but it could also be learned. And most of the things um, that are our competencies are learned. Um, for example, if I show you this image, most of you, I think all of you will say that this is a bus, right? Um, uh, and this is uh, obviously a T. And so interestingly, in all populations, we seem to have a catalog that everybody shares uh, that of, of interpretations of, of things in the environment that have the same name for all of us and mean the same kind of thing for all of us and we know how to interpret. And these are the embodied competencies. Um, there's a theory about this, this theory of social representation that studies precisely uh, all these uh, um, representations that are shared in a population. Sorry. <clears throat> right. And now the third layer, and <clears throat> which of course is of, of most interest to this specific center, is the regulation by institutions. Institutions can be defined, there are many definitions, but they can be defined as a system of established and prevalent social rules that structure social interaction, structure actually social action and, and most actions. And indeed, <clears throat> for most situations, you have a series of rules uh, that uh, every, um, I would say, a good member uh, of, of, the, of the society knows, for example, you know that uh, in a bus, well, you, you have to you have to wait in line. You have to give your seat to people who need it more. Uh, but there are also rules uh, that, that regulate uh, how frequent the bus is, et cetera, et cetera. And there are many, many forms of social regulation. Social regulation is basically what you're supposed to do according to the society where you're in. And it has a lot of shapes. <clears throat> It can be very mild, just like propositions, suggestions, or examples by others. Uh, 
Um, there's many types of norms, as you know. It can come also as feedback from others, influence, persuasion, recommendation, instruction, and it can go all the way to a coercion brute force, right? So there's a whole array of possibilities of you know, um, guiding and enforcing uh, these rules. And if you look at, at the legal, the formal um, ways that these uh, social regulations take up, if you take, for example, the US Code of Federal Regulations, uh, this contains over a million of these regulations, 175,000 pages, 238 volumes, uh, etc. So we have a lot of these things and they, um, they have the same principle, they have the same goal that is limiting what people are supposed to do, but these, these limitations and the way they're carried uh, onto the users take many forms and more uh, or less strong. And even low, you, you know, it can be bright line rules or it can be just uh, uh, recommendations. So the interesting uh, phenomenon here is that although I, I've described to you that there's a series of massive constraints on behavior, this is not the way we, we feel them, right? We rather feel these as opening, you know, a natural tunnel of behavior and then support for us to, to, to do the activity. Just like when you take the plane, you don't feel constrained all the time, or less it's like, you know, the, the, the reality unfolds in front of you as, as it would in a video game in a way, and you're, you're just channeled all along in the corridors and, and by people until you do the right thing. And there's a lot of little details that, that uh, take you um, uh, along and, and your tunnel of activity opens in front of you. And, and, uh, and then you, 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 as you progress in the installation, you, you just see this tunnel unfolding from one step to the next with feedback and feed forward that guides you uh, into uh, doing the proper things as expected in your culture and in this specific situation. Okay, so as a, as a second takeaway, installations are specific local societal settings where subjects are expected to behave in a predictable way. They are constructed by society for that purpose. They channel the behavior by offering a limited choice, right? Uh, and the choice is limited by determinants in three layers, physical affordances, embodied competences and social institutions. These determinants provide support and control at the same time. They provide feed forward and feedback, indications and also control. And they assemble at the point of delivery where they operate as a behavioral attractor guiding you into doing something specific. Not necessarily something you had planned or wanted to do, but you find yourself doing it, right? Exactly like when you take the bus or, or the airport or the airplane. A good metaphor for this would be a chemical reaction or a cooking recipe. So the result is predictable. You have distributed ingredients. They assemble at the point of, of delivery. They operate as a reactor and they produce a predictable result, okay? And uh, this channeling is both, as, as uh, Foucault would, would note, support and control at the same time. And this is true for all the layers. The material affordances provides the folding and also constraints. Um, embodied competences provide empowerment, but also self-control. And the social regulation provides you guidance, but also coercion, okay? So this is a, a tunnel that both, both uh, constrains you and, and, and pulls you forward. And of course, you understand that because of this, installations are the ideal design target to provide uh, support for activity and also to change behavior because these things channel behavior. So if you manage to design the installation properly, you will you know, channel uh, uh, the participants, the people. And I would like to, to make here a, a small note a sad note in a way that is, uh, you could say, well, I mean, this is horrible. We're channeled all the way, all the time. And I would say, well, yes, indeed. Um, the thing is, you know, uh, we have to have an iron cage uh, if we want to have a large scale society. People have to be uh, uh, predictable. And so 
channeling is inevitable. It's inevitable because people have to be predictable, otherwise there would be no society. Collective action also, collaboration, requires individual compliance to specific uh, predictability, right? So in a way, we do trade off uh, freedom for agency and comfort. And uh, this, there is no ideal solution. This is a political issue of trade-off. How much do we want uh, agency? And the more agency we want, probably the more control we will need to have. And of course, uh, where you put uh, uh, the cursor in that trade-off is, is, is a matter of political decision and power struggles, because some people will want it to be there, and some people want it to be there, and then, then the more powerful uh, wins more or less, right? So that, that's what society is about. We trade, uh, you know, freedom for some agency and comfort. Okay. Um, I, I saw there were a series of comments in the discussion, uh, but uh, do do interrupt me if, if, if there are some questions at, at this stage. Is that okay? Shall I go ahead? No, you can move on. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Now let's see how we can apply this for, for intervention. Um, if, if I can manage to get back, yeah, all right. So let me first take an example of a natural experiment uh, for, uh, for changes that will inspire us a little bit. Look at what happens with, what happened with COVID-19, right? We changed our behavior. We went uh, pretty much uh, to more, uh, uh, you know, working online and, and in distance, right? And this, uh, this created less transport in cities, right? Because we stayed at home. Why did we stay at home? Uh, because, uh, you know, we, we, we were forced to do this. There was a, a new regulation, there was a lockdown and also telework was allowed. Then we had new affordances for a lot of us, video conferences. And as a result, you know, there was an acquired competence both for individuals and organizations. So a new type of installation for work uh, was created, right? Well, it was not completely created, but disseminated. And, uh, and um, you see that it occurred on three layers. And the interesting thing is that the layers adapt to one another to, to make the, 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 the behavior fluidly uh, channeled. And it's the same thing if you look at the policies for to reduce car use in cities, many big uh, cities, you have this. Uh, uh, the, the local governments um, create new affordances with new bus lines, for example, bike lanes, bike rental services. They also make less parking spots. They also create rules like increasing parking fares or uh, they forbid uh, the circulation of, of, uh, of cars in certain bike lanes or bus lanes. And then this creates acquired competences uh, by the, the citizens who uh, uh, start knowing new ways of going uh, around the town to their, their office, for example, or to their work. Uh, they use the buses, they use cycling. They need the, so new behavior uh, is installed, uh, is installed in terms of acquired competence. And then this is a, a continuous circle because as more people cycle, they ask for more you know, uh, bike lanes and more bikes. Uh, and then the, the, the market produces uh, more, more bicycles and then, then the, the cars uh, become smaller and then there's more public transport. So you see gradually the installation changes on the three layers and adapts to channel more properly uh, the new behavior. And in a way the changes stick as the layers adapt to channel the new behavior. And that is what makes the new behavior stick it's, it's a chicken and egg uh, uh, um, process, right? And now let me show you in practice how uh, changes may occur at the individual, uh, individual level. And I'll take the example of, of the nurse medication round in a, in a Danish hospital. And first, let me describe you the process so you understand better the whole situation. So um, the nurse gets the prescription for the patients uh, on, on a, a computer program that's been filled in by the doctors with the prescriptions. And then she takes all the medications according to each prescription. She goes to the, the, the um, shelves, she takes the right medication, and then she takes the right dose of the medication uh, here. And then she puts it in, in, in little cups 
uh, that are put on a tray uh, with the number of the bed of the patient, and then she delivers it to the patient, okay? And so a critical thing is that you shouldn't give the wrong medication or the wrong dose to the patient. So there's a control system uh, that enables the nurse uh, to check that she's, she's putting the right medication in the right cup. And then there's another system that enables her to check the hospital, the system to check that she delivers the medication to the right patient. And I'll show you this, this in detail because this is a combination of the various layers in a real example, much more complicated than the kind of stuff we usually do in psychology, but the real world is complicated. Maybe I can show you very quickly what it looks like from the perspective of the nurse. Because you may not have a lot of bandwidth. I just wanted to show you that you know, these are the elements that handle the behavior and providing the right thing to the right patient. Now, let's look at the resilience of the system when there's a failure, okay? So this nurse is taking a medication, and here this is a liquid medication, it's in small glass bottles. And so the procedure is that she should take the barcode here and, and scan the barcode in, in, in the scanner here. And if it's the right medication, it becomes green, but here it becomes red. So the nurse is wondering what's happening. And so she starts checking, is this the right medication? Yes, it's the right medication, but it must not be the right barcode because it's not recognized by the system. But the nurse is smart, right? So she thinks, I know that all the, 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 the medications do have a barcode in the system. So perhaps this is not the barcode uh, uh, on, the, on the little bottle that I should use, but maybe a barcode that's on the cardboard. So she looks on the cardboard and she sees another barcode here and she puts it in the machine and then this is the right barcode. So you see here that there was a system of control of the behavior, but the, the material affordances failed, right? There was a wrong design of the medication because the, the, the barcode on the cardboard is not the same as the barcode on the little container, but the nurse corrected that. And so the embodied competencies of the nurse who knows which codes are not in the system, and that was not one of them, enabled her to correct and to have finally the good procedure, that is the things, uh, the right medication was indeed put in, in the right place. And so here, because of the redundancy, there was a compensation of a material failure by, uh, the, the, by the nurse, by the embodied competences, okay? This is a classic uh, system of uh, having a series of, um, you know, uh, defense layers. And uh, if you look at the, the classic theories of, of uh, uh, human failures and breakdown of complex system, like the, the Swiss cheese model, you see that failures happen when, when all, all the, 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 um, the holes are aligned. And here, uh, the resilience comes from the fact that uh, there are two layers and the holes are not aligned. Now, we'll see how the redundancy not only produces resilience of the system to failure, like I've just shown you, but also learning. And uh, uh, here's a way, there's many ways to, to, to learn through action, but here the one is going to, going to show you is through uh, instruction and guidance. And so it's the same example, uh, another nurse here, but uh, the, the, the nurse comes to the patient and here this is a, a, a old patient who has a problem with a, you know, a broken hip, I think, but, um, but she's um, um, a novice patient because she's never been to a, to a hospital before and uh, for that kind of thing. And so the procedure is as follows. The nurse, you know, uh, checks that she has the right patient by scanning, you know, here a barcode bracelet that every patient has. So she scans the medication and then she scans the patient to make sure that this is the right medication for the right patient. And so the patient has to show uh, her bracelet. And, uh, and so the nurse gave the medication. And then what happens in the end, at the end, is that the patient spontaneously shows uh, her bracelet again. But of course, it's still the same patient. So the nurse doesn't have to control that it's the patient again. And so she said, oh, no, madam, you don't need to show to me the, the bracelet again. Just once is enough. So here we have the embodied competence of the nurse 
right? That teaches the patient what is the right procedure and the patient therefore learns and the next time the patient will know. What has happened here probably is that in Denmark, when you take the bus, you, 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 have to, you have to badge in and badge out, right? And so probably the patient thought that this was the same kind of procedure I have to show who I am when I get the medication and when the nurse leaves. But here you see that um, again, resilience. And again, here it's the nurse in the system that enable to reconstruct the installation because now for that patient, the installation is complete. She has the embodied competence. And she has embodied them because there was success and there was reward here, okay? And I will give you another example. Uh, that's a personal example, actually, of another way of learning uh, uh, through uh, interaction uh, in, in installation. So uh, this is an example of where, you know, at the, uh, the London School of Economics, everyone has to, uh, you know, wear what is called black tie attire. And for men, this is, you know, tuxedo jacket and all the list here. And, and among these accessories, you have to wear a bow tie, right? And so this is my first, um, uh, you know, black tie event at the LSE. So I put on my uh, tuxedo and I put on my uh, bow tie, etc. And I go there and there uh, among the people, one of my colleagues uh, comes and meets me and she said, oh, Fadi, you have a nice tuxedo. And so I say, well, yes, thank you. Uh, and I'm very proud. And then she looks at me and she says, but you know, you should learn how to tie your bow tie yourself. Because I was using one of these pre-knotted bow ties. I don't know how to uh, tie a bow tie, right? And so I didn't have that embodied competence. And my colleague was acting as a vigilante. He said, no, like, this is a serious black tie event. You have to tie your bow tie yourself. You can't go on with pre-tied uh, bow ties. Um, and, uh, and so uh, the interesting thing here is that uh, when they learn something, uh, all the participants in the culture tend to become either helpers or guides or sometimes vigilantes. And I call that the vigilant effect. Like once you've learned, you become a cop for everyone else and tell them how to do, well, you know, here you've got to stay on the right of the escalator or here you've got to do this. But we are all the controllers of one another in society. Okay, so installation has a redundance of the components and that produces re resilience and education. And so this can enable channeling even novice or reluctant subjects because there is a reward and operant conditioning uh, that creates a learning process. And as a learning, uh, as a consequence, uh, novices learn in doing. So all installations are learning spots uh, to socialize uh, the newbies. And this also reproduces the you know, embodied competence part of the installation. It's very similar to die casting. You, know, you have the novice and then the installation and then they gain the competence, right? And they learn all the stuff that they have to learn. And this is how, you know, we come to learn about everything in society by practice. We have been embodying what to do because we've seen others who we've been told of how to do things. And one by one, we embody all these things like what is tea, what is a bus, et cetera, et cetera, through installations pretty much. A little bit through education, but usually education is reinforced by actual practice. Okay, so takeaway three, um, because of installations resilience, behavior on the fly, on the moment is appropriate everybody's channeled to do the right thing, but also people learn new behaviors and then they might also become themselves vigilantes. And more generally, I've just shown you the, the part where embodied competencies are reproduced, but the same kind of thing happens uh, of reproduction for um, you know, affordances with design and, and, uh, and also for regulations because your bodies designing regulations. And so society is continuously reconstructed through installations and practice reconstructs structure and vice versa with the installations. Okay, so a good installation for activity should frame situations, support and guide action for each step of activity and allow also for diversity, because as we've seen with the plain example, everybody's supposed to go through the same installation. 
right? So how can we redesign our behavior? By redesigning installations. And the way to do it is first to look at the activity step by step as it is now, the behavior that you want to change, right? And then you spot where to act. Usually there's a series of pain points or problem points in the various steps. And these are the ones where you want to intervene. <clears throat> then you can try to change the behavior at that point by targeting one or several modifications in the various layers. And the fantastic thing with installation here is that it tells you, you, you can work either on the affordances by design, or you can work on the embodied competences by trying to teach something to change the mind of the subject, or you can change the rules, right? So this is much more, you have much more leeway than just trying to persuade people to change. You can, in a way, induce them or force them to change by any of the three layers. And this usually involves, um, you know, other stakeholders, the ones who build the, uh, or maintain the, the physical environment, so the one who made the rules, or the ones who will be the gatekeepers, or the vigilantists, or the teachers. And so you have to check with all these other stakeholders uh, if they're okay with this, and also with the participants, if they're okay with that. So you can't just design things from the outside. You have to uh, think with the people, with the participants. Then it's the classic stuff. You simulate, you try, you evaluate, and you, you, you probe and you, you reiterate until you have something that you think is stable on your local experimental uh, grounds. And then if it's okay, you deploy. All right, let's look at this more in detail in the six minutes that I have left. Um, I must tell you a little bit about activity theory, Russian activity theory, if you're not familiar with it, because that's what enables cutting activity into manageable chunks. It's very, the intuition behind it is very similar to Herbert Simon's ant. You know, uh, Herb Simon was observing an ant on the beach and he noticed that while the overall trajectory was determined by the goal of, of the ant, you know, trying to go back to the ant hill, the local trajectory was determined by the terrain, right? So it had to go to on the left or right of that rock because it, I mean, that's the local trajectory is locally determined, but the general direction is determined by the goals and the motives. Okay, Russian activity theory states that the subject tries to reach a goal coping with the conditions given. In the, in the situation that they need, right? So they go from step to step, trying to, to solve one task at a time and create a trajectory from what is the current state to the goal. And the goal is the final representation, the representation of the final desired state, okay? And on the way, the subject may switch goals opportunistically to satisfy uh, other motives, okay? Um, and the value of this, uh, activity theory for design. I think I had a slide also here. Uh, I'll just leave it if you want to look at it more in detail in the, in the video and stop it to, to describe exactly what are the elements of Russian activity theory because it's, it, it's tricky. The same names might designate different things uh, in, in sort of Western uh, psychology, but it's very efficient uh, activity theory. It accounts for the interaction between the subject and the situation with this idea of goal direction, right? Uh, it enables cutting the flow of the behavior in relevant chunks that is sub-steps and sub-goals and sub-tasks, okay? Which are manageable. The main problem is actually to cut the whole thing into where to intervene at which point of, of the behavior. And this is very efficient for this because it forces you to look step by step at what people are doing. And the devil is in the detail most of the time, right? And also activity theory forces us to clarify the motives of the subject. You know, the goal is something that feeds the motive. Motive is like, I'm hungry and the goal is taking a meal, okay? And if you don't know why people want to go to that goal, well, you don't know what will be the satisfaction criteria, okay? Right. And so you analyze the activity step by step. You may use any kind of technique that you like. I use subjective evidence-based ethnography because it's very powerful, but critical incident ethnography 
interviews, whatever, just try to figure out what people are doing precisely at, at, at every detail. But do this objectively because what people tell you is not actually what they do. They don't remember exactly what they do. They will give you a representation of what they do. You have to observe, right, what they're actually doing. And then you may, uh, you know, spot issues, places where there are problems. And then each turning point, each small step, you may find some faulty, you know, affordances, communication problems, poor skills of the, the, the subject, some frustration that they express, poor peer support, bad rules or whatever. And always remember that you can address the problem with any of the three layers. You know, you have three possibilities for intervention. You have design on the affordances, you have the capacity of training or teaching, and you have the capacity of um, uh, acting on the rules, right? And you can actually uh, solve a problem that is a physical problem by creating a rule, right? You know, uh, there is danger here. You should go over the cliff and you forbid to go over the cliff. Of course, you could also put a fence, right? Or you could tell people, don't go over the cliff that is dangerous. These are three ways of obtaining the same result that people don't walk over the cliff. And this is just about the same thing for every behavior. You always have the choice of means not just always trying to influence the, the, the person and what they do and what they want to do. You can also act on making that physically impossible or socially forbidden, right? So in making this choice, you have to think, what's my agency? Do I have power of design? Do I have power of training and influence? Or do I have regulation power, right? And then you will need to redesign with the stakeholders because you're never alone and it's society. And so you have to see who's involved, who are the stakeholders and see what's possible with them. And maybe they can do some of the work, design, training or regulation, okay? And so that's where you identify what can be done. You do this by visualizing things on the timeline. You see the problems, you, see, you, you plan your interventions and then you do them according to what are the low hanging fruits depending on what's your agency, design, training, or regulation, okay? But the rationale is to provide an installation that makes every step fluid, right? And, uh, and to go for the low-hanging fruits in terms of uh, cost and effort for you in, in intervention, all right? So in brief, you try to facilitate the achievement of objective of users, you solve problems either or with material design training and regulation, depending on your agency. You try to design for resilience with some redundancy and you negotiate changes with the stakeholders. Okay, and that's my final takeaway because I think this is my last minute. Many behaviors, most behaviors in society are channeled by installations. Installations have three layers, affordances, embodied competences, and social regulation. The redundancy of these layers makes installations resilient, right? Users do learn in acting, in doing, in situation. And that's also in situation where all these layers assemble at the point of delivery. Installation theory is a pragmatic framework for analysis of behavior and planning intervention. Right. Installation theory is also a theory about how societies reproduce piecemeal and distributed manner through installations, but I don't have the time to talk to you about this today, but that's the theory, right? But the pragmatic framework is what I described today. Changing the behavior can be done by redesigning installations. To do this, you analyze the activity step by step, and where there's a problem, you redesign the layers to make you know, the behavior smooth and easy by changing appropriately whatever layer you have agency to change, right? And try to operate with the stakeholders, not for them, because what you do for them, you actually do to them, okay? And that's it. Thank you.
Great, Sadi. Thanks so much. Very interesting. Um, so we had a few questions along the way. I didn't stop here because Paulius was doing a great job answering. Um, but some of these questions are longer. So maybe I'll give the floor to the people who asked them. Um, and that might be the easiest way of asking the question. Um, so Arvind, maybe if you want to unmute yourself and just ask the question. You're probably on mute. Yeah. So Arvind, if you're around, feel free to ask. I mean, I can read out part of it otherwise. All right, so let me just, okay. So let me just, um, in the meantime, let me just um, state some of the questions. So basically Arvind was referring to uh, a situation. So what happens when the installations and how to work isn't clear to people, right? So how does learning take place? Is it like a trial and error type of approach? You sort of discussed this on one of your slides. So maybe you can provide a little bit more insight into you know, what happens when there's uncertainty and, yeah. Uh, what do you mean? What happens when there's uncertainty about what about what to do? Yes. Okay. Well, I mean, uh, it, it it's a very um, difficult question to answer if, if you don't make it a bit more specific because um, it could be either because you have many possibilities that are allowed, right, or because uh, it's not. Uh, enough well specified what you have to do, but there's still something that is expected. So if the question is about how should you change the installation in this in this situation, is that what, what I understand? Or that then you should make explicit what is the frame uh, of the uh, uh, what the, what is expected. And so you can make it more explicit just by you know putting a sign or by making sure that there are people who explain that to you. This is what happens in, in most places where you come in and you don't know where to go. For example, uh, there's a, a, a big conference. Well, there's also always a welcome desk, okay? Right. Uh, when you're on the road, typically there's signage, right? Uh, when you want to go to the toilet and you don't know which one you should use, there's, there's a pictogram like depending on your gender. I mean, from the time where there were only two genders, I know that situation is becoming more complicated uh, nowadays, but uh, this is the type of thing. Just try to clarify what people have to do. I'm sorry if, if my answer seems a bit simple. Uh, no, I think that's actually uh, in line with Arvind had in mind. So he wrote in the chat that it's late, so uh, he wouldn't ask the question out loud, but it seems that you answered okay. what he had in okay. mind, so, so that's great. Um, Next question was from Daniel. Daniel, are you able to, to just ask out loud? Um, yes. Uh, can you hear me? I assume this is yes, coming. very well. Yes. Great. Uh, well, first of all, I thank you. Really excellent talk. And I think it's it's the installation theory is really a great way to frame the various constraints on individual behavior and sort of how those arise and really are internalized. One of the things that that strikes me is that the other major component is in how these kinds of installations help you predict. The behavior of others and that is you know how as you as you mentioned we facilitate collective action and such and so really what i'm wondering is um have you tried to look at how would installation theory understand or predict how does uh cooperation break down and so you know what happens when other people don't actually explore uh conform to our predictions of them does that lead to conflict does that change our installations does that break down institutions or lead to institutional change what exactly goes on with in sort of conflict situations yeah, well, I mean, this. The, I think, um, interestingly, for example, in, in uh, Polius's work, in, when he describes what happens in Colombia, where, where you might have some conflicting norms, these things happen, right? Um, what, one of, one of the, the, the cases where things like this happen is that um, it's not clear in what installation you're operating. Right? For example, you, you might be a part of several um, groups and, and several societies, and then it's not the same rules, right? And so depending on, on <laughs> whether you think it's, it's the, you should behave, I don't know, as, as a member of the gang or, or as a member of the family <laughs> or as a member of your organization, then you may have different behaviors. So as, as I said, there's always kind of a, a, of a power struggle over who controls uh, the behaviors and the installation. 
usually uh, installations are rather clearly located. So there's someone to whom this installation, I wouldn't say belongs, but is under the responsibility. And those are the ones who should be choosing the rules, right? But then it's not always completely clear, especially in open spaces, open social spaces. And another situation where typically this is the subject of a lot of work in industry is accidents. Accidents is typically somebody who is not behaving as expected or something happened. So very often it's a combination as we know in an aircraft accident, for example, it's a combination of you know, faulty affordances, um, poor embodied competencies or judgment or inadequate regulation. These things might be very complicated, right? Uh, we have a lot of you know, biases, for example, you, you think you know, all the cognitive tunnels, for example, uh, are one example of misinterpretation of where you are in the installation. Another one could be, you know, in an in installation, people have different rule, roles, right? And the role is, is, is basically, as Stozil defines it, is, is the set of behaviors that are, expect, that are expected by others from you, while the status is the opposite. It's the behaviors that you can expect from others, right? But the, so, for example, if I'm at the dentist, you know, it's clear what he has to do and what I have to do, right? So there's no confusion. But in some places, there might be a fight for who has what role, like in a, in a collective, like who leads or that kind of thing. So there are a lot of, of situations like this where it's unclear what installations are or it's unclear what the roles are, or the installation is faulty. No installation is perfect. They're evolving constantly. Does that answer? OK, thanks. Great. Um, Anuba, you had, a, you had a question as well that uh, probably has already answered, but maybe you have a follow up to that. Um, no, I'm just curious to to see what Sadi maybe has to um, share regarding that. Um, Sadi, thank you for the great talk. Um, I think this was really insightful. Um, I was just curious. I know you spoke about embodied competences earlier. Um, I'm I'm just curious. What happens in scenarios where, for example, embodied competencies of other actors uh, or individuals get in the way of individual performance, like? Could you speak about like specific settings um, where that becomes a barrier and maybe impacts individual performance? And, um, you know, I'm, I'm just curious to learn more about that. Yeah, well, there's a very interesting thing in, in Russian activity theories that a collective can be a subject, okay? So for example, you're together uh, uh, as a group and you're trying to have to, uh, to uh, you know, uh, realize a goal. But in fact, and Russian activities always says that too, that uh, people may have divergent motives and goals. And this is often what happens when we try to cooperate. So it could be because some people are not willing. It could be because they don't know how to. But uh, there are issues of alignment of the, the, the competences and aligns, alignments of the goals also of the participants. So it's, it's not just what you're saying. There's many situations where cooperation is not good because people do not share the same goal and do not have the necessary competencies to reach that goal. Right? And typically, um, what the, the, the response of society is, is, is at several levels. There's one that, you know, in a meeting or in any kind of groups, you always have two types of regulation. One is to maintain the group as a group, and the other is try to bring the group to the task, right? Like, for example, we'll joke, etc., but we'll also try to process the work at hand. So there's, there's this thing of trying to make the group cohesive, and this creates influence for people to align their goals and also their behavior with others. Then the other issues you're talking about, like you know, the, they don't have the embodied competences. We see that all the time. And we see that with the young, for example. And we have a lot of processes that have been very well described by anthropologists like uh, Barbara Rogoff, for example, is that the novices learn by uh, uh, 
peripheral legitimate participation. They see how others do and then they acquire the competence, but we don't let them do and participate unless they have already acquired the competence. And this can actually be regulated, like who can't drive on the road if you don't have a driving license, right? So some societies have implemented this system of making sure, especially for hazardous activities, I'm thinking about nuclear plant piloting or stuff like that, you make sure that the guys do have the right competence and you test that all the time, right? So you are pointing at a real problem, but society has a lot of systems to make sure, especially in critical situations that the participants do have the right competences and they are controlled for that constantly. And even like, for example, if you think about road traffic, there are very, very few casualties. Like it's like, I don't know, five or six per hundred million kilometers vehicle. It's, it's unbelievable, the safety of these things. It's because people have the competences, but also because their regulation are enforced by the police. Thank you so much. Appreciate that. Great. So we had one more uh, follow-up question by Heidi with respect to um, conflicts and norms. Heidi, maybe you can clarify what uh, uh, what that was referring to when Sadi was was um, explaining his part. Actually, um, I was just responding to um, the chat, <laughs> but um, Saudi, it's great to see you. This is Heidi. Hi, Heidi. Yeah, good to see yeah. you. Too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm in the States right now, so a bit of a time zone difference. But, um, well, actually not. You guys are on the East Coast for Novak. Anyway, um, Mike, I was just processing as you were talking about when, you know, um, Cialdini talks about the focus theory of norms and how when you have a descriptive norm and an injunctive norm or prescriptive norm and they don't align, people tend to go with the descriptive norm. And I was just processing uh, during the chat how that might work um, in the context of installation theory. So maybe you have some thoughts on that. Well, the thing is, <clears throat> norms are not the only prescriptive uh, regulation system. You see, there's norms, there's laws, there are codes of practice, etc. So, so depending on, on, on the situation, people sort of arbitrate between all these injunctions, which some of them are aligned, some of them are less aligned, and they sort of choose whatever seems acceptable given the context, if you see what I mean. We psychologists have, have the tendency to always focus on what's in the head, right? But, but when you look at actual, I mean, the reality is that we are also governed by things that are laws and that rules and, uh, and things like that. And, and they also have a very prescriptive uh, force. And um, what, what we see is it's very complicated. For example, when you, you discuss with professionals, professionals will usually not apply to the letter the code of good practice or the regulation that are supposed to like they're supposed to operate with blows protection blows and but this is very complicated if you want to do very precise stuff so a lot of guys say you know i'm good i'm, I'm so good that i can manage without the blows and so there are, there is a conflict of various norms and of course they will probably not do this if they're filmed or if their boss is there but then they will do it if they're alone. And, and so it, it's not just the matter of, of um, what is the prescription, it's also how strong it is supposed to be, how it is enforced, how it is conveyed to the person in the current situation and their own experience on how much they can manage to go uh, uh, a little bit aside of the rules, right? And so, of course, when you just ask people, you don't get all these fine detail of gray shades, but in situation when you ask people, they're absolutely capable of telling you, this is what I'm supposed to do by the, by the rules. This is what I'm supposed to do in, in my group of professionals. This is the way I do it. This is the way I do it today because I'm tired. This is the way I do it today because I think the danger is very small because that cable is not so hot. This is the kind of thing that people are telling us. Uh, and so it's true that there are norms and there are various types of norms, but the situation in the detail is often more complicated than, than just that. I don't know if I'm... Uh,
Are you still there or am I mute? No, 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 you're good. But um, oh, okay. <laughs> sounds like that was a satisfactory answer. So then, um, I mean, we are sort of at the time limit, but I see Monica's hand up. So if you have a, a very short question that can be followed by a very short answer, then then let's let's hear that. Okay, thank you. Uh, this is really interesting. Um, I was wondering, suppose that you have installed a system that is supposedly resilient, how is it evaluated? What systems are used for evaluation of systems? Ah, okay, very interesting question. That would take us far, but the, 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 this is also how you evaluate the quality of the system and how you improve it, okay? So there is a system of values behind any type of evaluation. That seems obvious when you say it, but what, what is the value is the critical resource that actually enables to reach the right result or satisfy the right motive. Okay, so for example, in a family situation, care would be the main value, but in a professional situation, for example, efficiency would be one, while in commerce it would be the benefit, or in, in, in the media system it would be maybe your reputation. So these are the core values, and, and uh, uh, you know, Luhmann or, or, uh, uh, would talk about uh, um, uh, the generalized media of communication. So there are a series of things that are important for that type of activity to make it successful. And usually this is the one that is used to evaluate its quality. And also the quality is, is connected to the resilience because a resilient system, a good resilient system is one that enables reaching the result in any situation, in, in any variation of the situation. So, I can't give a generic answer more than that, but there are many types of, of values. Uh, uh, Mr. Duvernay, uh, well, uh, Tevno and Boltanski distinguish, I think, I think, seven what they call qualities of worth. Uh, depending on the, the the systems, you will find different systems of value. But there is usually it's the same kind of thing that will enable uh, evaluating the quality of the system. And it's, it's resilience. And usually there's not just one. For example, in industry, you would have efficiency, but you would also have safety, for example. And then you would have a, a cost, right? And all these are the values that guide the quality of the system. And they will be used to evaluate the quality of that specific installation. Great. And usually the problem is that these things do not align. So you can make something very efficient, but then it's going to be risky or it's going to be costly. You see what I mean? It's usual trade-offs. Yeah. All right. So thanks so much uh, for the Q&A. Thanks for the great answers uh, and uh, for the talk. Also, thanks to Abdelaziz for the great opening uh, presentation. Uh, Paulius, anything you want to want to say as closing? Remarks. Uh, no, thank you very much for attending. And remember, in three weeks, we have our next talk. You will get the video for this talk next week uh, in your emails and then um, a reminder of the next talk as well. Great. All right. Well, thanks, everybody. Thank you, thank you, everyone, for listening. Thank you so thank much. You. Bye.